feeling the present here and you can feel that entity or whether 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 you feel the divinity of the moment however that happens and then you know the very last sphere is one that that even even dissolves the the boundary between the i and the thou of divinity and and you just your sensitivity reveals you to be uh, an instrument of consciousness within the whole. You, you are one way of, that the whole has of finding out about itself. Right, right. And this is, you know, this also connects into, you know, you, you also talk about um, the enteric ner- nervous system in regard to the whole body-mind-spirit connection of how our body works and how we assimilate energy and how we assimilate actually things that that come up in in our reality in our waking days and you get i i was really intrigued by this part of the book and i'd i'd really like to get into this because you refer to this as the second brain and um can we talk a little bit about how this works within our 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 being and how we um, retain and how we move through and how how our body reacts. Oh, I, w- I would love to. It's, it's so funny because <laughs> if you go up to somebody on the street and say, how many brains do you have? They'll look at you like you're nuts. But, but it, we've known for over a hundred years that we have two brains in the body. And there's just no space within our story, within our culture story, to accommodate that information, what, what do you mean? There's, a, you know, we're so devoted to the head that there's there's no room to recognize this brain in the belly. But it's a, I mean, it's not a it's not a metaphor. It's physiology, and you're right. It's known as the enteric nervous system. Um, it's known as the second brain, and and it's the way I distinct because the two brains are very different. Right now, they're hugely out of balance, but. But if the if the brain in the head is where we can consciously think, the brain in the belly is where we can consciously be. And right. we've lost, you know, we've lost the ability to be here. And what that means is we've lo- we've disconnected from the world around us because being is just coming into connection with with all that is. And so our thinking right. runs away, independent of being and comes up with ideas about the world that are that are basically unaccountable to the world itself not part of the world's thinking and so if what we do tends to be out of harmony with the world and and these you know I identify the two brains as um the male aspect of our consciousness and the female aspect of our consciousness and it's interesting that when you go back to the early neolithic Thinking was experienced in the belly, and this isn't this isn't a matter of 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 evolution that we're somehow different, um, you know, physiologically from people ten thousand years ago. There's, there's we're, we're the same thing, you know, in in the scale of evolution. But our consciousness evolved from a female-oriented consciousness where we actually could feel. Our thinking in our belly, and then by the time of Homer's day, the, con- the you know our thinking was in the chest, and then eventually it moved up into the head, where we've been ever since. So we've we've left this ability to just be, and moved into this kind of supercharged ability to reason, and our culture honestly believes that reason is the pinnacle of our ability to cope with the world and, and with ourselves and come to terms with it. And and it's like it's like we've got this blind spot. Reason is impotent in very fundamental ways. For example, you can't reason your way into the present. You just can't do it. It it's 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 never going to work. To come into the present, you've actually got to reverse that evolution of our consciousness that carried us up through our bodies into the heads and drop down through the body again and come to rest right. in the pelvic bowl. 
And I one, loved the oh. elevator exercise. I thought that was the best exercise. <laughs> I thought that was oh. the best one in the book. <laughs> oh, thank you. I just, I love it. And it's like, it's like, a, uh, I should explain for people listening, the elevator exercise um, is an exercise whereby you sort of imagine this elevator shaft running down through your body from the like, top of the head all the way down uh, to just beyond the pelvic floor. And then you feel your the center of your thinking or the center of your awareness as as the elevator and you just allow that to drop down through the shaft and you can actually feel it tangibly move through the body until it comes to rest on the pelvic floor and people trying that for the first time might find it a little difficult they might find oh they can drop it down to the chest and then it gets stuck and that's that's not it's not a source of discouragement. It should be a source of of hope because the exercise then has let you come into contact with a with a little block, a little shadow in the body. And if you can allow that little block to melt and soften and if you can give it some love from your heart, then then that elevator will start to descend again. And one of the one of the main benefits of allowing the elevator to descend is it brings us into a place where we can integrate because the the pelvic intelligence is our integrating genius it's self organizing it doesn't require the oversight of the cranial brain it it just weaves the world into a whole so as long as you're stuck in the head, you're sort of addicted to information and you're addicted to, to understanding things in little packets. And, and the world doesn't quite add up to a hole. And you think if only you can get enough of these little packets, you're going to fill up all the holes and, 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 and turn it into something, uh, something sound. But it just, it just doesn't work that way. So, so it's, when you, it's when you drop all those perceptions and all that information down into the pelvic bowl that that it's funny it's funny because I, I talk about this in the book what happens is a is a perception acquires sensation as it drops down and your readers could try this if you you know if you think of a, a, an idea like fire is hot or the rose is red and you feel that idea in your head and you let that idea drop down through the elevator shaft all the way down through the body until it comes to rest on the pelvic floor, you'll find that the idea transforms into sensation. And there's no way of knowing what what that will be for you. But it's a wonderful exercise to try. And that's, you know, in our sensation-deprived existence, which is what living in the head does to us, we have denied ourselves the ability either to be whole ourselves or to feel the world itself as a whole. And, of course, those two are pretty indivisible. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I know the the elevator exercise was one of those those pivotal points in reading the book where I, I literally felt the shift within myself. And mm-hmm. it was um, it was it was un, unrealized dress and tension that I was holding and it was amazing when the elevator shaft would go down where in the body it stopped for me to address those areas uh-huh. so I was I was very grateful yeah. for that it was very timely actually so it was um it was it, it, I find it I found it the best exercise I mean you have so many in here and they're all wonderful but I love that and I refer to that you know a lot now that I've I've read read this and you also talk. You you make a great, um, a, a pretty uh, powerful statement here that that I really loved, and it was talking about our genes and how we can actually switch on and off our genes by the choices that we make, and in being conscious of how um, what we make, we can actually redo our genetic makeup. Um, what can you elaborate a little bit about this for us? There's a there's a relatively new field of study called epigenetics, 
And we used to think that your and this was the you know the the dream that the that the we could find the atom of the self, the the the, the little bit in which the entire self uh, resided and could be explained. And that theory kind of fell apart a bit because because well, epigenetics is a big part of that. There are there are tendencies um, that are latent that can be activated. So, what stimulated the research? You know, there are these phenomenal twin studies that were done. And for example, this this one woman um, was admitted to a hospital having suffered a, a psychiatric. Um, it, it, she was schizophrenic and and had suffered a, a debilitating episode. And the emergency doctor on call was her twin sister. So here they have exa- they have they have the, an identical twin sister, they have identical genes. Wow. And could not be, you know, further apart. And there were there were lots of, of instances like that. And and you know, when they looked into it, they realized, well, geez, when you go for a run, you can be you can be activating your genes. You can be actually switching certain genes on. Um, and 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 all the choices we make. Um, there's a there's a huge plasticity uh that our material view of the world has has made us resistant to but you know neuroplasticity is a phenomenal field now where where they find that that the that our brain will adapt they did a very really interesting study um with a mindfulness meditation, they took people who were susceptible to um, stress, and they did, I think it was an eight-week study, they had them doing mindfulness meditation, I think it was 20 minutes a day, over this eight-week period. And they could, there's a little part of the brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala becomes more dense. Structurally, it changes with anxiety. And at the end of the eight-week period, the people the, uh, who had done the mindfulness training had a change in the density of the amygdala. They actually changed their brain. And and the the you know the the, the it, what it sets up is you've got a choice here. You can either be in a stressed situation, or you can be in your body. That's right. what, that's basically what the experiment shows: is that pe- people who learn to come into their bodies in a mindful way learn to come into a way of being that was much much less stressful. So it's not it's not it's not that their behavior, the anxiety, was determined by their genes. It was it was learned behavior that they could then shift, and it's it impacts. All of us, though, doesn't it? Because you've got your right. you've got a choice at any time of the day. You can be come into your body, or you can be in a place of stress. It's pretty right. remarkable. And and then that bounces off of everyone you interact with. So it's you know mm. this is it you know society's going through its crazy chaotic energy right now, and um, there's sometimes when it's it's definitely more neurotic than others but there's um there's a there's a common thread that's going through in fact there's there's two threads that i feel there's a uh, that are coming through there's one where people are really seeking this they're seeking this information that you've provided in this book they're seeking this balance this sense of authenticity this sense of peace within and then there's the other side of the coin where everyone who um is addicted to that neuroses and that anxiety feeling and that that angst is really um, getting fueled by everything within our society that feeds to that. Um, when you when you talk about how we disconnect in regard to staying in our head and not dropping down into our our feeling center or our emotional peace, when when we are going through this this period of shift and change. Is there in a, an emotional piece that you can provide our listeners in what they can expect when they go through that shift? Because I know what it is for myself, um, but sometimes, you know, it comes through differently for different people. And what would...